Hey guys, this is the next island and water problem. We've already tackled one of these before. If you want to see the problem, you know what to do. Hit the little floating caption above the screen. It's a pretty simple problem. I'd suggest you solve that first before coming here. It will give you a nice idea about this genre. With that being said, let's hit this hard level problem, number of islands. You are given an n by n grid where zero represents water, one represents land. An island is a group of land tiles that are connected either vertically or horizontally, surrounded by water on all four sides. And we also have to assume that the entire grid is surrounded by water. How many islands are there? We can see our sample input here. Four means that our grid is of size four cross four. Zero represents water, one represents land. Let's try to visualize it. This right here is the grid. Each of these blue tiles is a zero. And each of these brown tiles is a one, a land tile. If we have a look at this tile right here, it's not vertically or horizontally connected to any other tile. Diagonally does not count. That means it forms its own island. This is an island of size one by one. Similarly, the tile at position one comma zero forms its own island. And these tiles, these four tiles that are in an L shape are all connected either horizontally or vertically, which is why they form a third island meaning our final output is going to be three. As we can see right here, the only constraint is that the dimensions of the island is between one and 100 and the array consists of zeros and ones. Now the screen's open guys, try solving it. And once you're done, head on back. I'll discuss the solution straight away and I'll give you two methods. One is a more instinctive method that is less space efficient. And one is a slightly more complex method but it takes way less space. This right here is our input. First, we iterate through the grid until we hit a one. We ignore every zero. When we hit a one, we've got a market as visited. How do we do that? Now we can maintain a separate visited array, but we can do it a lot more efficiently by using the very same array. In the same array, we can update one to zero. And that indicates that that tile has been visited. Effectively, we're destroying that land tile. So here we've destroyed that tile and we've got to check the four surrounding tiles. There's nothing above it since it's on the first row. So we check the tile to its left, to its right, and the tile under it. Those three tiles are all filled with water, which is why we increase our island count by one. The count is initially zero and we continue iterating through the array. When we hit the next land tile at position one comma zero, we repeat the same process. First, we destroy the island to mark it as visited and we check the four surrounding tiles. There's nothing to its left and the three remaining tiles are all water tiles, which is why our island count increases once again. As we continue iterating, we'll find a third land tile at position two comma one. Here's where it gets interesting. First, as per usual, we destroy the tile. Now we first check the tile above it. Then we check the tile below. The tile below it is a land tile. However, if we move there, we lose the current position. That's because we've destroyed the tile. There's nothing to indicate that it's a land tile, which is why we've got to make sure to maintain the position, to store this position somewhere. So we're able to return to it later to perform the remaining two checks. One way of storing it is by using recursive function calls. In that case, it gets automatically stored but it's a lot less efficient memory wise. Now we've discovered that the tile under it is a land tile, which is why we've got to visit the tile and destroy it. We check the three tiles around it. All three tiles are water, which is why we return to our previous state. Remember, we've got two more checks we've got to do. We have to check the tile to its left and the tile to its right. The tile to its left is water, so we ignore it. The tile to its right is land, which is why we've now got to move to the right. Following that, we destroy this tile and check the remaining four tiles, up, down, left, right. Right is land, so the same process gets repeated one final time. That tile is destroyed, the tiles around it are water. That means we increase our counter by one. The first method is by using recursive function calls. We simply iterate through the array. Whenever we see a land tile, 
we're going to call a function called trace island. Now trace island has three parameters. ARR is going to be called by reference, meaning it's not going to use up any extra space. The same ARR is going to be used in every single function call. However, a new I and J are going to be created every time a new function call is made. Why is that? As we've already discussed before, we need to store the old values somewhere so that we're able to return to that point. That is why these I J values are going to be called by value instead of reference. That is to say, every time a new trace island is called, a new IJ gets formed and the old IJ value is still stored somewhere so that the function calls can return to the old point. In the worst case, the entire grid is going to be one big island. That is, the grid is going to be filled with ones. Every time a neighbor is discovered, a new IJ value gets created. The total number of IJ values are going to be n squared there's going to be n squared pairs of ij. And the total space complexity is also going to be n squared. Now let's go back to this state and try to discuss an alternate approach. After we destroy the island, instead of going down and then retracing our steps, why don't we simply store all the significant values? Instead of first checking the element above it, then the element below it, then the elements to its left and right, why don't we check all four simultaneously? We check all four, up, down, left, and right, and whichever elements are land tiles get appended straight away. Now we don't need to return to this tile because we've already stored all the significant values. We simply need to visit the neighbor tiles which have already been stored. When we visit the tile under it, it gets destroyed. And again, we perform four checks parallelly. There's nothing important. So that tile simply gets deleted. Now we check the last tile, that is the tile at location 2,2. We destroy it and perform four parallel checks. The only important tile is the tile to its right, the tile at location 2, 3, which is why we store it, destroy it, perform four parallel checks. And now that there is nothing left in our queue, we simply say that one island has been destroyed and we increment our count by one. Now, if you want to get more clarity about this method, I'd suggest clicking the caption above me. We've already tackled a problem called letter combinations of a phone number. And in that problem, we discussed an alternative solution using queues. It's very similar to this right here. So I'd suggest you check that out as well. Neighbors is initially empty and our number of islands that is count is initially zero. We iterate through our array. Uh, like I said before, both of these methods take a complexity of n squared. If that element is a land tile, we add it into our queue and we remove that land tile. We destroy that land tile. Now we've got to check all the neighboring elements of that tile. So its value is going to be stored in row and column. And we check the four surrounding tiles. If any of them meet the criteria, we're going to add them to the queue and we're going to delete that tile. When this entire while loop is done, this loop starting from line nine, ending at line 28, an island is going to get destroyed. That's why we increase the count by one because it denotes that one more island has been destroyed. Once we finish our entire IJ loop, every single island has been destroyed. So we simply have to return our count. You may be wondering why we destroy a tile so early. If we don't do this, a tile will be visited multiple times. In order to avoid a tile being visited twice, we set it as zero right away. Now let's see if this works. Compile, test, and submit. And as we can see, every input, every one of the seven inputs has been accepted. Now guys, that's the solution to this problem. I hope you liked it. If you did hit the golden trio, they pop up on your screen and leave your comments down below. It's been Vivek guys, and I'll see you all next time.